Growing up as a kid in the South, Selma specifically, to me it makes sense that you would be an activist based on where you lived and what you know if you paid attention to your history, if you were involved in your community. How did you grow up? You know, that's, I, that's true, I think, on some level around Selma. But believe it or not, my family would, you know, my family felt like they were very clear. You're going to go to school. You're going to get a degree. You're going to get your husband. You're going to get you a good job with some good benefits. And that's how this going to roll, right? And so even early on, my activism wasn't necessarily something that my family is, like, trying to push me towards. As a matter of fact, you know, that seeing activists be murdered, that people, activists in our community, uh, had, had financially were struggling. The activists in our community oftentimes were embittered and many times they were beat down. And so, you know, they wanted me to go a, another mainstream route because they thought they would brought, it would bring protection to me. And I, and I would love to say that it was my environment that created, and maybe some on some level that's true, that created this space for me to become an activist. But the truth of the matter is, I, you know, it's kind of in the, in the words of Lady Gaga, in some ways I think I was born this way. I, I never, <laughs> rem- I'm serious. Like I remember, I remember being a little kid. I always tell the story about, um, I like, I like Easter shoes. I guess I still like shoes. Right. <laughs> and so I had, <laughs> this is where it all starts from. But I, I had these patent leather Easter shoes. Do you remember the patent leather shoes that if you scrape and scuff them, they would have a black mark scuff mark on it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, I had these patent leather Easter shoes and I was a little kid. I was like in kindergarten or something. And, um, I would always, I never, ever, ever could stand seeing people take advantage of other people. I don't know what, it, what something about me would get activated when I would see this. And so I remember one Easter, I got these white patent leather shoes and some socks with some ruffles around it. And you can tell me nothing. It didn't matter if I had on jeans, it didn't matter if I had on shorts, I was wearing my Easter shoes, right? To the point where even in my family, it was kind of like a joke. They was like, she gonna put them Easter shoes on, I sure was. And and so I remember there was this fight, there was this, uh, these in, on my block, there was um, these big boys that were getting ready to, um, that were messing with this little boy, right? Who I knew was scared and who was afraid. Now here I am, I'm the, I'm the run of the bunch. I'm the smallest of the bunch and I'm a girl by the way, right? And there was nothing in my mind that I had any concern whether they beat me up or not. The only thing I was thinking about is, damn, I'm gonna scuff up my Easter shoes. <laughs> other than that, <laughs> Other than that, I was ready for it. So I say that to say, in some ways, I never remember a, it always, my entire life, it always, I was always kind of obsessed with two things. You know, the first thing was I never liked to see people be treated unfairly or treated in a way that I thought that that's not right. You know, I had so this this kind of sense of you should treat people well, right? And then the second thing is I always had this fascination with power. There's also a running joke in my family that anywhere we would go, and I often would go with my grandmother because I lived the first part of my life actually in Mobile, Alabama with my grandmother. We would go, wherever we would go, I would say, I called her mama. I was like, mama, who who owned this? You know, who who owns this? And she was like, what? Well, we would be in Kmart. I said, mama, who owned Kmart? And she's like, baby, I don't know them people. Like, why are you asking me? It didn't matter. Where <laughs> went, right? So I always had this desire and I, and I, you know, it was a desire. Now, as I'm older, I realized I always had this fascination with power. I wanted to know who had the power to do things. And I always had this sense of that's something that you are not supposed to abuse. You're not supposed to use that against people. And so throughout kind of growing up, I mean, I had for the most part, a relatively kind of normal childhood. I had a, my family's the bomb. Let me say that again. My family's the bomb. (laughs) Um, You know, they were working class. They were working class, just really good people um, that, that, that really, I think at the end of the day, more than anything, they didn't have money, but they really had a wealth of ethics and belief on how you treat people and how you move forward. You know, and so I had, and it was interesting because I had this, I had the extended family experience. It was my grandparents um, and my grandparents were always old. My granddad was born in 1905. My grandmother was 1910. So I was like, I saw a picture when they were young and I was like, well, who are these people? They were always older people and old. And so 
you know, I had this wisdom of these older people that, you know, I kind of grew under. And I think that, that was part of the shaping. Um, the, that was part of my shaping. It was my brother and I, you know, I think that that was part of my shaping. And then as I, this kind of natural inclination I had towards this, this kind of understanding power and feeling like we could, you know, and I was, was a happy child. I was a child. I was like, everybody's supposed to be happy. Aren't you supposed to be happy? Like, how can I make you happy? And so all of those things, I think, shaped who I am, even as an activist before the politics. You know, the, the, it was my humanity that actually shaped who I am. And it was the politics that kind of gave me some texture around, okay, how, how it was necessary, how this whole thing around power, how it plays itself out and what I could actually do to actually shape that. And so that was part of, you know, that was part of kind of how I grew up. I had, I grew up with this notion of, you know, and then seeing these different things that I didn't have the politics to understand it at the time. But I remember thinking, what is so magical about the railroad tracks? And some, no matter where I would go, right, on this side of the railroad tracks, the houses looked a certain kind of way. And that's where white people live, right? And then on this side of the railroad tracks, that's where black people or people of color live. And so there was something about that. I had a deep sense of, I don't know how to explain it, but that ain't right. Something ain't right about this. And so I, I always had kind of this inclination, which I do believe that is just a part of a kind of a calling. And I'm not so certain that that's not in all of us, you know, when I, you know, when I talk to children, you know? Yeah, it's uh, right from wrong. Um, the ability to see the difference um, in a positive way, in a negative way, you learn that right away as a child. I, I could see you looking at these railroad tracks thinking, well, why is that like that? And this is like this. Right. When I grew up, because I grew up in LA, I remember telling my mom watching the news, I would only see black people as gangsters and, and robbers and prostitutes and pimps. And it was always this image watching the news. And I was like, that doesn't represent my family. That doesn't represent That's the right. black people I know. And while you're not, you're not able to articulate it, those images sit in your spirit. You know, I often, I don't know if I've ever publicly shared this story. I think, you know, I actually had seriously contemplated, but I wasn't making a lot of money at the time. I think I was making like six, six dollars an hour. You know, I had attempted to have an abortion and mm -hmm. the challenge uh, with it was I, I raised them. I came up with the money. Um, my son's father was really clear about he wasn't going to participate like he like I wouldn't even tell him like he was like he wasn't gonna participate and so I saved up the money and I had gone to his interest I had gone to a um an Arby's on my way to the place and had some food and got to the place which was two hours away the clinic two hours away and my purse was gone so all of this money this money that I had saved it was a big deal for me because I wasn't making any money it was done it was gone and so are you yeah you know, what happened yeah. Like, I don't stole know. The money? I just, I, like, my purse was gone. I don't know where my purse was, no nothing. Oh. Um, and so, you know, I was like, okay, I will say this, you know, it's a, it's a very long kind of story around how this happened. But when I was seven months pregnant, I got a, by this time, I had moved back home, you know, we're excited. We're about to have the ba baby. And I, this particular day, I decided that I was going to go pick my baby's crib. I was going to go and get all this stuff for his crib because um, at that point I had leaned into it and I got a letter in the mail from Arby's and I opened up the letter and it's like a $700 check. And I'm like, what is this? What, where is this from? So it's what essentially happened, which I had no idea er earlier, the, um, I, my purse, I had left my purse in, in Arby's and the manager and one of the workers stole it and split the money. And so the, the man, the worker got caught stealing and the manager fired him. And so the worker turned on him. <laughs> and so I literally Arby's wanted me to testify against them. I didn't. Um, but, but that was, was the really money ironic. that was in your purse. It was the same money. It was the same money. Yeah. So they gave you your money. Wow. They gave me my money back. Wow, 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 right. Wow. So it was just, you know, that's why, you know, I think like wow. moving, just move, Part of part of what I really understand is I also understand I am a spiritual being having a human experience. And there's some things that I control and there's some things that I do not control, right? Mm -hmm. And so whenever I'm kind of led in spirit to move towards something, right? And even that's that, like I said, even the sense of justice, 
you know, I didn't need anybody to politicize me to tell me that these houses don't look like these houses and the people over there don't look like those folks. I, I didn't need a whole political story. I'm just looking at them like something ain't right for that. Why these people can't have houses like that, right? And so I think I, I think on some level, it is all, each of us have this sense. There's an innate sense. There's, of course, we're socialized to believe some things are right and wrong and that comes from a variety of things. But there's some basic pieces that a child, like, like hits another child, that child knows that's just not right. You're causing pain. And so I think that part of all of us, I'm hoping that even with my work, which is more, it's less political than it is around, how do we awaken kind of this humanity in us to move us to action so that we're willing to actually be able to protect and prevent other people from causing harm? That's it. That's all I want to do. 